In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Marianne's guests are leaders in their field, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in their own work. They teach others to develop, refocus, and grow. Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I am so excited to be spending this time here with you today. We've got quite a show lined up. You know, some people touch our lives without us even knowing about it. Our first guest is just that kind of person. The positive impact he's made in our world is all-encompassing, and yet for some of us, he's probably someone we're just learning about, Dr. Larry Brilliant. Now, Dr. Larry is here today to talk to us about his book, Sometimes Brilliant, The Impossible Adventure of a Spiritual Seeker and Visionary Physician Who Helped Conquer the World's Worst Disease. Dr. Larry is one of Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and winner of the TED Prize. Among his many achievements, Dr. Larry was the first executive director at Google, and he currently serves as chair at Skoll Global Threats Fund and co-founded SIVA Foundation, a program which has restored sight to over 4 million blind people around the world. So without further introduction, let's welcome to the show Dr. Larry Brilliant. Hello, Marianne. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. I am so honored to have someone so distinguished as you spending time with us. It's very kind of you. Oh, well, I mean, your book just goes over an amazing life, and it, it just unfolds a story about miracles and a, an amazing time. Did, did you want me to respond to that? I'm happy, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to talk about the book, but I don't know exactly where to begin. Uh, oh, well, do you know what? Well, why don't we start from the beginning? Yeah, I think that the, you know, the, the, the joke about the sophomore slump was harder for me. Uh, my dad was diagnosed with uh, lymphoma and with a kind of a blood cancer, and he was dying. Mm-hmm. And I was, I think I was 17, 18 when that process started. And I had no inner resources, and he was the most important person in my life. He had been a a prize fighter, a boxer, and uh, he just had a great sense of humor, and, and just a wonderful sense of humor. And I was uh, at the University of Michigan, and I had started off in what was then called atomic physics. They didn't even, didn't even have nuclear yet. I don't know if they discovered the nucleus yet. And um, as my dad got sicker and sicker, and I felt more and more helpless and um, I just kind of locked myself in my room uh, in Ann Arbor and, and um, started reading superhero comics. Now, in, in retrospect, I understand. I was just looking for some magic word I could say and turn into Superman or Captain Marvel and save him. But yeah. uh, I, I just saw a little note in the local newspaper that Martin Luther King was going to be speaking, and I, I vaguely knew who he was. This was 1962, 1961. It was before... He got his Nobel Prize. It was before the Mississippi summer. And he wasn't very well known in, the, you know, in Michigan at that time. But I decided that I would go. And he was the first person that, first time I'd ever gotten out of that room since I heard about my dad's illness. And uh, it was a terrible day. Uh, in Ann Arbor, the rain doesn't always fall vertically. Sometimes it falls horizontally. And mm-hmm. you can't even walk uh, across campus. But I did. And I got to this hall that held 4,000 people, and there were only a couple of hundred of us kids who had gotten there. And Martin Luther King stood up, looked around, saw all the empty chairs, and started to laugh. And he said, this is great. There'll be more of me to go around. You all come up on stage. And about half of the people, half the students were too intimidated to go up on stage, and they just pressed up against him. And uh, from down below, and the rest of us made a circle around him. And I think it was almost six hours later that he had finished talking. And I had never he- heard anybody talk like he talked. Uh, I mean, of course, he said that he 
envisioned a future where children to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. He said that the arc of the moral universe bent towards justice. We've heard those quotes subsequently. But what he said to us that day was the arc of the moral universe doesn't bend towards justice. The world does not get better on its own. You've got to get out of your chair. He said you've got to get off your ass. You've got to jump up, grab that arc, twist it, pull it, yank it towards justice by your actions. And, you know, if you're, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a kid and you're feeling helpless and someone like Martin Luther King speaking in this way that he did that I'd never heard anybody speak, touching your heart, if he says that there, there can be a better world and that you can play a role in it, in fact, indeed, it's only if you all play a role in it that the world will be better. That's the most liberating thing you can be told. And for me, it got me out of my depression, and I immediately, that day, signed up for a kind of an alphabet soup of, uh, mm-hmm. of a- uh, activist organizations, NAACP, course, and all the ones that you might think of. And I became an activist. I was infected with the virus of activism that day. Well, and I know later on you were even arrested with Martin Luther King in Chicago. That's true. Um, He was uh, organizing the march and just beginning to put together the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement into one movement. And uh, there were thousands of us who came to uh, Chicago. Uh, By then I was a medical student, and so I was asked to wear my white coat and uh, ostentatiously dangle my stethoscope so that (laughs) the police would think that somehow... Uh, the, these, this phalanx of white coats was protecting Martin Luther King from being beat up. And mm-hmm. we were all, I would say that we were all um, uh, apprehended and uh, we were detained. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the, and, and, and if you ever do want to do activism for something you believe in, um, the, a good rule of thumb is to always be arrested with a couple hundred of your best friends. Because then, as they did for us, they, they couldn't take us to Cook County Jail. We were too many. So they put us in pretend jail. And the nice thing about pretend jail is we had Martin Luther King there singing, um, We Shall Overcome With Us, and they let, let us have guitars. <laughs> and they didn't, they, they, didn't put hand, they didn't put handcuffs on us. And the cops were really nice because <laughs> there were so many of us. And it was, uh, it's a different kind of experience than some people would get if they were. Um, put into jail, but for us, yeah. that it was just another opportunity to hear him preach, hear him speak. I know he's quite a has been quite a galvanizing speaker. You know, I have to say, your book is one of the most extraordinary books I have ever read. It was such a great oh. read. I I just did not want to put it down. <laughs> well, thank you. That's, that's so kind of you. Yeah. Well, and and so you touched a little bit that, you know, you were in medical school, and I know you had probably one of the most interesting internships a young doctor can have. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it was was vaguely hypocritical, I think. Um, All of us who had been touched by Martin Luther King or by the anti-war movement against the war in Vietnam or the civil rights movement, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we sort of coalesced around a couple of organizations, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which was a group that would accompany the civil rights workers and go down to Mississippi and try to encourage people to uh, support civil rights. And then we we created a student version of that. Um, And we decided in medical school that many of us would try to do our internship in the same city, thinking there would be more kind of a density of us. And if we were more honorable in retrospect and more maybe – we're a little less hedonistic, we would have chosen Detroit uh, or we would have ch- chosen um, you know, someplace in New Jersey, but instead we chose San Francisco, which gives you an idea of how, uh, how conflicted we were about uh, having a good time versus doing good. And uh, I wound up at Presbyterian Hospital in San Francisco, uh, and as my internship was coming to a close after a year, a group of Native Americans took over Alcatraz Island, which is just off the shore of, uh, of San Francisco. And the 
this this former prison, Alcatraz, had been closed and declared surplus property. And uh, just like we're seeing in the Dakotas right now, the the Treaty of Laramie, uh, it, it was our agreement with the native tribes that if the government of the United States seized land that was Indian land under eminent domain, if that land were ever declared surplus, it reverted back to the ownership of the native tribes. Um, and, of course, we broke that treaty, as we did so many times, yeah. and the Native American community said, we want Alcatraz, we want to make it into a place to do the history of the Native Americans in, in the United States and make it into an educational facility. But the, uh, the government didn't want that, and uh, about 100 Native Americans took over the island in a very peaceful way, and the Coast Guard put an embargo around the island in a very peaceful way. It was San Francisco, after all. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, the local community in San Francisco, 80% were in favor of the Indians <laughs> in a nice way. Uh, and Herb Cain, who was a, uh editorial writer, kept on writing, how come nobody's going out there? No doctors are going out there. There's no water. There's no medicine. There's no food. Uh, and then a woman who was nine months pregnant, a uh, Lakota Sioux woman named Lou Trudell, decided she wanted to give birth to her baby on Indian liberated land. And Herb mm -hmm. Cain escalated his rhetoric, saying, is there no doctor willing to go out there and deliver the baby? Maybe she'll die. I mean, how could you not go? Is there no doctor? I thought that was just an ad saying, Larry, come on out on Alcatraz. And I did. <laughs> and I lived on the island, and uh, I helped her deliver her baby. And after that, um, there were uh, a couple of accidents, a couple of Indians who cut themselves and were bleeding. Um, some because the moment was so powerful. And I medevaced them in a, in, a, in a Coast Guard cutter, and I had to keep sewing them up as we were bouncing up and down in the water getting to San Francisco. And when we got there, the ambulances took them to uh, San Francisco General. But it, it seemed as if every, news, every newspaper and every television camera in the world had come there and put their lens in my face and said, Larry, what, what do the Indians want? And I, I'm from Detroit. I had never met an Indian in Detroit. But that night uh, I got a call from, when, when the shows were on TV, I got a call from Warner Brothers, and they were doing a movie, and they were looking for a young doctor, uh, someone who would play a rock doc, or would actually mm -hmm. be the rock doctor in these rock and roll festivals that they were doing and be an extra in a movie about the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane. And, and in fact, those bands never did show up, but Jethro Tull and Pink Floyd <laughs> and Joan Baez mm -hmm. did. And we made a terrible Warner Brothers movie <laughs> called Medicine Ball Caravan. And uh, that was my first meeting with a lot of the people who had been recruited to be extras. And one of those groups was a commune called the Hog Farm, part of the Merry mm -hmm. Pranksters originally, Ken Kesey's group. And on the first day that the um, the group that was going to be, the cast that was going to be in the movie got together, my job was to vaccinate everybody against, of all things, smallpox. Because the idea was the final uh, concert would be in England and we'd have to come back. Uh, and you had to have a yellow, yellow card that said you were vaccinated against smallpox to so come back. And one of the first people that I vaccinated was this character who was dressed as a clown. He had rainbow-colored teeth. And I vaccinated him against smallpox. And when I did and I looked at him, I realized, you know, I'd never met anybody like that growing up in Detroit. This guy's <laughs> and, uh And he smiled. He started to talk. And I said, I want to understand him. What? How does he know all this? He, he spoke with such authority. I, I want to understand this. And that was Wavy Gravy, and he's been my best friend for 40 years. And we traveled from San Francisco to you know, Yellow Springs and Boulder, where you are, or close to where you are. Mm -hmm. And um, then we did a final concert on the mall in Washington, D.C., and then we went to Canterbury with Pink Floyd. And when it was over, we decided we wanted to keep going and uh, get a couple of new buses and drive from London uh, to uh, East Pakistan where there had been a cyclone. And it took us almost a year. 
and we had two buses and 40 young people from all over the world, and we drove through Turkey and Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan and India. And I'll just say one thing about that, because you can imagine 40 hippies and two psychedelic painted <laughs> buses, and every place we went in those countries, we looked like Martians, <laughs> and everybody was so kind to us, mm-hmm. but we didn't understand where we were. But what we would do is we'd visit every church, every temple, every mosque, uh, every place of pilgrimage that we could find along the way, every Buddhist vihar. And every little village we went to that was around these sacred places, there would be a moment when Wavy would bring his bag of toys and I would take my medical supplies and we would kind of set up shop in a little tiny village like Jalalabad, Afghanistan. In these days, you don't think of Jalalabad in any context other than terrorism. But, but I remember so many of these in the Kurdish villages. And if it was a Buddhist village, there'd be a shrine in the center of the village and a, an image of Buddha. If it was a Hindu village, maybe Vishnu. If it was Muslim, a picture of Mecca. If it was Christian, there'd be a Mary or a Jesus or a cross. Yeah. And not all the time, but two out of ten or three out of ten of those villages, right next to the picture of Mecca, right next to the picture of Jesus, right next to the image of Buddha or the image of Vishnu, there'd be a photograph of John F. Kennedy. Hmm. And, Why and do you think it, that it, was? Because America represented something in these places. I'll say the names again. Afghanistan, mm-hmm. Iraq. Iran, Pakistan, India, Nepal. These are places that we don't have a very warm and fuzzy feeling when we're talking about these countries. Yeah. And my kids can never make that trip again in a, in a bus. Mm-mm. But, but there was something about America, the idea that was aspirational and that John F. Kennedy represented maybe like a rich uncle who had a sense of decency and justice. I don't think it was just about Kennedy. I think it was about America after the Second World War. We were such a a noble, I would say, occupying power in Europe. I would say that we were the place that people looked to. And and we were far from perfect. There was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese internment camps. Mm -hmm. There there was the war in Vietnam. There were so many things. But on balance... We were the greatest of of all nations, and we represented something, or people wanted us to represent something, which was the decent, good guys. Maybe that's why they wanted us to be the world's policemen. It's going to be a long time before there'll be a picture of another American president in those villages, especially now. This is a very difficult time for us. But I think that that needs to be our our goal in the world. We, we want to be that. We, we want to be as good as those villagers thought we were. And we want to build a country that we can be so proud of uh, in the way we behave wow. domestically and all over the world. Who was your last case of smallpox? A little girl who, whose name was Rahima Banu. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of last cases of smallpox because there were a lot of different variants but yeah. the, the last case of what we call killer smallpox in nature, the last mm-hmm. case of variola major, the, the one that we were trying to eradicate, w- took place in Bola Island in Bangladesh. And she was part of a chain of transmission that, depending on which science you read, either went all the way back to Pharaoh Ramses V or maybe to the 15th century. Just the other day we found a crypt and a mummy uh, from Lithuania villainous that had smallpox her when she had this disease and the scabs on her face and her hands fell off and they were caked they were burned by the hot sun of Bangladesh and there was nobody around who was not vaccinated that chain of transmission that virus had no place to go and it became extinguished Hmm. that was eradication the word eradication means to pull out by the roots. The rad is like a, like a radish, to pull out by the roots. And on that moment, I, and I, I was in front of her. I sat in front of her. I took a photograph of her. 
And for years during the program, I was giving balloons to all the young children when I would see some kids trying to vaccinate them. And the balloons would say in Hindi and Urdu and, and English, smallpox can be stopped. And I happened to have a balloon like that when I was there in Bangladesh. And I gave it to her, and I took a photo of her with a balloon, the last case of smallpox, with a balloon saying that smallpox can be stopped. And it's, it's my great treasure. Oh. What, what an amazing story. We're not going to get too much into I mean, the smallpox story. Is fa- it's, just, it's, it's just gripping. It's absolutely amazing and gripping, and and we want I want people to buy the book. So you got to get out oh. there and get sometimes brilliant. They want to hear the rest of that story. But before I let you go, I just have to ask. So where are you focused now? Are you? I know at one point you were talking about eradicating polio. Is that a, a focus of yours? Where are you? Uh, where do you see yourself going next? Well, I, I think we're going to eradicate. Polio. I think that the world community will eradicate polio within the next two years. Well, you know, Dr. Larry, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. I know that our listeners can connect with you on your website at LarryBrilliant.com and be and sign up for your newsletter, join your social media, and see what you're about. And, of course, buy your book and get involved. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. Oh, thank you. It's really a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you. And for our listeners, we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. to Moments with Marianne. Our next guest is here today to talk to us about boosting our productivity. Gosh, it's a topic that we can all use for this new year. So he's the author of the book, The 5 a.m. Miracle, Dominate Your Day Before Breakfast. So let's welcome to the show, Jeff Sanders. Well, thanks, Marianne. I'm excited to be here today. Hey, hey, it's great to have you here. So, you know, I, I really like how you take a different approach to dominating your day, and your book is just right on target with that. Yeah, I think I, I definitely uh, realized that for myself about uh, five years ago because I was on a path where I, I was productive, but I was kind of erratic. And I, I moved to a new system where I was a lot more intentional with my time, and that made a huge difference for me, uh, which then allowed me to – then I wrote a blog about it, and then I wrote a small book about it, and then all of a sudden became a podcast and then a full book, and this whole concept kind of exploded because I realized – there was a lot of potential there for me to do more with my day, and then everyone else, of course, wanted to learn more about that. So it's been a really fun journey to figure out ways to, to be more intentional and to get a whole lot more done. I think a lot of times when people think about, you know, maybe about this approach, they're looking at it going, gosh, you know, okay, so if I start my day at 5 a.m., what does that mean if I work late, or how does that mean for me as far as sleep is concerned? You know, am I, am I able to really function? Yeah, I know that a lot of questions people have about, like, is 5 a.m. even necessary? And I think that this is one uh, issue I address a lot, uh, which is that from my perspective, 5 a.m. is totally arbitrary. I made it up for myself because I had, at the time, uh, five years ago, I had a day job where I had to be at work by 9 a.m., and I wanted to wake up early enough to go for a run because I was training for a marathon at the time. And 5 a.m. made the most sense for me. And then I realized long term that that was the best for my schedule. So I chose 5 a.m. for me personally. Uh, but a lot of other people have realized that the, those early morning hours are very valuable. And a time that you would wake up somewhere near there would give you similar benefits, whether that's time by yourself or time to work on an important project. And so waking up early is, I would say it's part of the process, but certainly not required. The real requirement there is intentionality. So like you said, if you have to work late or you have other, you know, a life uh, commitments you have to really adhere to, 
then you have to work around those, but you can still always get back to those core principles of, of being more intentional and really asking yourself, well, where's the opportunity in my time today uh, to get the most value that I can? And so that's the real approach is asking yourself, how can today be more valuable and what could that look like? And would an earlier morning, you know, wake up call actually make sense of that? Well, and, and having your day, I mean, I came from a sales background, so I know having that time to myself where phones weren't ringing and I wasn't being bothered by my sales agents gave me the opportunity to kind of work on the things that I really needed to dedicate my time to. And so how long when you started this process did the transition take for you? Well, right from the beginning, I jumped into 5 a.m. immediately, which I realized since then is not very common, and it really is not that effective. I think for a lot of people, uh, if you were to say, well, tomorrow morning, be out of bed at 5 a.m. and make that stick, uh, they're going to be very upset with you, and then they're also going to realize that it's kind of painful because it's a, a major shift in the way that you, you know, your sleep patterns have to be adjusted. And so what I have discussed uh, since then, which I, I've used myself as well, is a much slower transition time period. So you might say, well, tomorrow morning I'll get out of bed just 15 minutes earlier, and I'll go to bed just 15 minutes earlier. And then with those 15 minutes, you would do something with that time. So you might say, well, if my alarm clock was for 7, now it's 645, um, I'll get up at 645, and I'll also use that time for something that's valuable. Whether, like you said, whether it's a sales call you want to make or whether it's doing some yoga or whatever the thing is that matters to you, uh, you would do that during that time period. And then a few days later, you can make the shift a little bit earlier uh, until you get to your ideal time frame. And then at that point, it's a much easier transition, and you're going to be able to make that stick long term, which, of course, is the goal. You know, I've been following you for some time, Jeff, and I have to say you're quite the dynamo. So I'm pretty sure that what, you know, people are looking at you going, gosh, how is he doing that? And I want to be able to do what he does. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of energy or, you know, a lot of enthusiasm for life, which I think that I do in, in many ways. But I think that for me, it's also a, the kind of thing that I have trained myself uh, to become more of the person I want to be. And what I mean by that is that there are certain things that I have put into my life that allow me to be uh, more of my best self more often, which means waking up early. It could mean going for a run. Uh, it could mean having a really good morning smoothie. Uh, when I do those things that I know work well for me and do those things consistently, that I get those exponential results from there. And so for me, that's what I'm always trying to do is to figure out for myself what works well. And then, of course, for my audience and for the, my book readers, uh, what's going to work well in your life? What are those elements uh, that allow you to be more of your best self? And how can you do those things as often as possible? Because then when you do, you get those amazing results uh, so much more often. Mm-hmm. Well, and I know that you have, again, you, you were talking about your podcast and your books. I mean, I, I highly suggest that our listeners go out and pick up your book, The 5 a.m. Miracle, so that they can get ahead of their game. And, you know, listen to your podcast because you really kind of touch on different points of the, you know, this whole process, and also you're talking with great people. We always love talking with great people. So one of, another question I have, I'm just kind of, you know, toggling over to this is, so how important is it for, time, for people to have, like, really good time management skills when they start this process? Well, I know for me personally, when I first started it for myself, I realized that if I wanted to wake up earlier, I would have to be more intentional with the way my time was utilized. And so I think it's important in the beginning uh, to be very intentional with the, like every single minute of your day. It doesn't mean you have to actually have time management skills nailed down in the beginning, but what it does mean is you might say, well, if I'm going to wake up you know, a little bit earlier, here's what I'm going to do the time I wake up. And then five minutes later, here's what I'm doing. And five minutes later, here's what I'm doing. Because when you approach it with that kind of intentionality and be, to be that specific about your time usage, then you're going to be more likely to actually stick to your plan. And then, of course, you'll realize that if you repeat that process day after day, you get really good at that. And it's not difficult then to maintain it uh, to the point where you don't need that list at all anymore. You don't need that structure because you form that habit. And so really, time management, like anything else, is a skill you can develop. And if you begin with that process of just saying, well, here's what I want to do and here's the times I want to get those things done, that's where it starts, and then from there you can escalate it. You can add in more, you know, fancier techniques or strategies. But it really is just a very simple, fundamental idea of just wake up early, be intentional, and follow that process day after day. Well, and it's it's outlined in your book, so they definitely need to pick that puppy up and and read it, <laughs> and and really it, it's a game changer. Now I know in your book you talk about um, that we should just forget annual goal setting. And I know with, you know, we're in the third quarter of this year, 
coming up on, you know, January 1st, everyone wants to make these great intentions for the year. Why is this not a thing that we should be doing? It's a great question. I mean, a lot of people love, you know, the annual goal setting time period. I know that looking at my podcast and, and my website, I, I get a lot of activity in January. A lot of people are very excited about the new year, and there's lots of enthusiasm and plans being made, and that fizzles out really fast. And when I see that every single year. The, the beginning of the year, there's all this excitement about what's possible, but it doesn't last. And the problem is, is that if you look ahead at a full 12 months on your calendar, it's really hard to know where you're going to be a full year from then. But you do know where you're going to be tomorrow or next week. It's, it's much more tangible. It's much more short term. And so in my book, I describe basically a 90-day system or a quarter system where your life is really scheduled in three-month chunks. And I, I chose that because that is so much more manageable to say, well, I can get something significant done in three months. Uh, but it's not too far away that I can't predict it. But it's just far enough away that I have time to do something that really is significant or valuable. And so that's the way that I have lived my life for many years, and it's so much more effective because I can use that short-term time period to have the urgency that I would need uh, to move forward quickly, but also be able to predict where I'm going to be in a couple of weeks. And so that works out really well if you stick to it. Uh, it then you don't lose the enthusiasm nearly as much as you would over the course of a full year. And so I think it's, it's so much more valuable to have short-term goals, uh, to be ambitious, of course, with those, but to not look ahead too far because life changes just way too often. Mm-hmm. I would agree with you on that. Now, I know that you also talk about reviewing, um, going back and doing reviews. And can you explain for our listeners what's the importance of that? Yeah, the review process that I go through, which is it happens uh, frequently, um, is really important for me uh, and for many reasons, uh, one of which is that I have a, a formal weekly review process. And so once a week I'll go through and I'll look at my life and say, well, what happened last week? What was good about it? What was not so good about it? You know, what were lessons that I learned? And then what do I want to accomplish this coming week? And then based on the lessons from the previous week, I simply say, okay, well, that's what happened last week, and here are my goals I already know I want to accomplish. Now, how can I better prepare for this coming week? And I'll do that same process every single week looking at how can my life be more effective, more productive? How can I make sure that I'm actually moving towards my next goal? And then I'll do that same thing on a monthly uh, process. I'll do a quarterly review. And then, of course, at the end, once every 12 months, I do a kind of a big picture review as well. But in each of those review processes, all I'm really asking myself is those basic questions. What am I doing well that I want to continue? What am I not doing well that needs to change? And then how can I put action steps into place to make sure that I actually am evolving and, and living differently to make sure that I'm always on track to my next goal? And this process, it sounds pretty obvious, and many of us kind of do this by default anyway, but to have a formal process to go through, uh, I think it, it makes it so much more tangible because then you can really say, like, on paper, here's what happened and here's what I'm going to do about it, which gives you so much more clarity on what to do and when to do it and how to do it, which for me is so valuable because I can then make real progress in a way that I can, I can track over time. And that, to me, it shows the progress and really keeps me on track long term. Hmm. And that's exactly where we want to be. I know that... Um Many different groups and organizations and universities will hire you to go ahead and do keynote speaking um, speeches for them in regards to this topic and just kind of get people motivated in the right direction. Where can our listeners, you know, kind of connect with you? If, if Do you do um, personalized coaching that they can say, hey, you know, I'm kind of stuck in the weeds here. I need some help and, and reach out to you for that. Do you do those things? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have, I'm not doing coaching at this very moment, but I, I do offer that throughout the year uh, in different phases in terms of what my projects are. But uh, jeffsanders.com is the website. You can find out what I'm up to. Um, jeffsanders.com slash speaking is where my speaking information is, and slash coaching is where my coaching packages are listed as well. Uh, so there's opportunities there to work with me uh, depending on what I'm doing at the time. It, it kind of varies throughout the seasons of the year. Uh, but, yeah, I'm definitely open to helping people to figure out ways to be more productive in whatever way that I can. Oh, perfect. Well, you know, Jeff, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Yeah, thank you. A lot of fun today. We're going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. 
For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Ben Wexler is a gifted leadership development and strategy consultant for professionals who want to transform their organizations and careers. Through a uniquely personalized set of processes, participants discover their unique knowledge, how to leverage that knowledge and experience, and then put it all together with a global strategy. You're more valuable, your organization is more valuable, and the change is viral. Contact Ben at 630-881-1074. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. Our next guest is Ryan Mannion of the Travis Mannion Foundation. This is the Moments with Marianne Veterans Highlight Group for the month. The Travis Mannion Foundation empowers veterans and the families of fallen heroes to develop character in future generations. So let's welcome the show, Ryan. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Marianne. Hey, it is fabulous to have you here. Now, I came across your foundation, of course, online. And I've got to ask, how did this foundation come into being? Sure. So our uh, organization started uh, very uh, close to the end of 2007. My brother, uh, First Lieutenant Travis Manning, he was a uh, Marine uh, on his second tour of duty in Iraq, and he was killed on April 29th, uh, 2007, by enemy sniper fire. Um, Travis was awarded a Silver Star and Bronze Star with Valor for his actions that day. And, you know, after his death, uh, devastating to lose a brother. I, you know, I can't even, I can't explain the, the tragedy that it is, the heartbreak that it caused my family, but we wanted to make sure that we remained strong, that we continued his legacy. And we decided as a family to make sure that we continue to serve in the way that he did. So we started the Travis Manning Foundation with the idea that we were going to continue Travis's legacy and the legacy of all of the men and women who had given their lives in defense of our country. Well, and I know that um, your found, uh, Travis's foundation has a tagline that has some significance. Can you go over that for, for us a little bit and what that means? Sure, and and really gets back to the whole idea of, you know, because my brother was so sh- strong of an individual, we knew that we had to do something pretty special to, to continue his, his legacy. And before my brother left for his second deployment to Iraq, he was stationed in Camp Pendleton in California, and he came back to the East Coast. I'm from Philadelphia uh, to spend time with family and friends. And while he was here, him and my husband, uh, went to a Philadelphia Eagles game. We're longtime season ticket holders, and uh, he wanted to make sure that was something he did. So just a few days before leaving in December of 2006, my brother and Dave went to an Eagles game, and, and as my husband recounts, they had a, a really great time at the game. And as they were leaving, my husband said he couldn't help but put it out of his mind uh, that Travis was, was heading back to Iraq. And he said, as much as I was trying to, like, push it away, I couldn't. And as they got to the top of a flight of stairs at the stadium, my husband turned to my brother and said, you know, why don't you let me push you down the stairs and maybe you'll break your ankle and you won't have to go back to Iraq. And he said that my brother turned and got real serious with him. And he said, you know what, Dave, if if I don't go back to Iraq, then somebody much less prepared for the job at hand is going to go in my place. If not me, then who? And those five words have become really a global movement for us. Uh, They're the five words that my family and I live by, and they're the five words that we're trying to get this entire country to live by because we believe that my brother was a a tremendous man of character, and the idea that we can use those five words to redefine America's national character, that's really what it's all about for us. Well, and, you know, and I completely understand and and can um, can really feel what it is that you have built here. I mean, 
my father, when he was alive, he was a Marine. You know, once a Marine, always a Marine. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you, um, you know, it, it's good to put meaning to the work that they that they do for our country. And, you know, and I think if not me, then who is a great statement that I think a lot of us can relate to. Yeah, I think, you know, especially given present day, you know, we've been at war for almost 15 years, and you look at the idea of this post-9-11 generation of men and women who step up and serve, weren't all volunteer force. So while my brother was uh, the person that actually spoke those five words, this generation of men and women live by it, right? They are are Mm -hmm. all volunteering. They're asking themselves, it's not me, then who, when they step into that uniform. And what better way for us as a country to use their examples to kind of shape what our character looks like. And so that kind of leads me to my next question. So what services does the Travis Mannion Foundation offer? Sure. So we work with both veterans and families of fallen service members, and we do a few different initiatives, our biggest being our character does matter. So our whole goal is to use veterans and families of fallen service members to empower or to uh, teach character to the next generation. So we empower these veterans and give them the tools to, to mentor our youth. Uh, we do that through uh, training programs where we train veterans and families uh, on how they teach character to the next generation. They go out, and then they're able to deliver everything from 45-minute presentations to student-wide bodies to 10-week leadership courses, where they're working really closely with a small cohort of students. Uh, Beyond that, we have transition programming for veterans, because not every veteran is ready to step out of uniform and step Mm -hmm. right back into volunteering. So we want to make sure that we get them to the place where they're successfully transitioned and we can help them. Um, So, again, we do... um, we do uh, transition training where we bring veterans in and we take a holistic approach, not to just employment, but helping them to identify their passions outside of the military. And finally, um, you know, uh, with Families of the Fallen, we want to make sure that we give them the same opportunity that our family was afforded by starting the Travis Manning Foundation, and that is the opportunity for them to continue their loved one's legacy. So we take families of the fallen on expeditions uh, all over the world where we ask them to serve for a week in their loved one's honor. I'm uh, excited to be heading to Guatemala in the end of January with 24 families where we will build a home for a Guatemalan family who right now is living under a tarp. And these families are able to carry on their loved one's service by giving back to others. Wow. What, what a profound message. And it's, it, what I love about the foundation, it really helps veterans from, and their families from, you know, be pretty much all the way through from transition to community service and, and just being able to be more involved, um, with other veterans in the community. Yeah, and I think that's, for us, that's the biggest thing, making sure that we bridge that connection. You know, a lot of people talk about the civilian military divide. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know we're as divided as it seems. I think what we just need to do is give veterans the opportunity to showcase the assets they are inside communities, and that's what we try to give them. We try to give them um, the opportunities to get back into their communities and and show what civic assets they are. Mm. So what are some ways that veterans can, um, you know, either sign up or be involved um, with the foundation or their families? Um, well, we have a tremendous amount of volunteer opportunities. So um, it, the best way is to go to our website, travismanion.org, and check us out. And there's a lot of different ways you can get involved and be a part of this It's Not Me Then Who movement. Mm-hmm. So they can, um, they can sign up for the transition um, workshops that you have there, or um, just get in you know, c- contact you and say, hey, I want to donate my time in the community, and then they can take it from there? Absolutely. Okay. So um, what other – I know um, because you guys are a nonprofit that you're also doing fundraising and um, have opportunities for people to donate. Um, and with the start of this new year, what a great time to kind of do something great for a foundation. 
what other ways um, can they connect with you and be able to go ahead and participate with the foundation if, let's say, they're not in the military? Well, I mean, again, outside of the military, there's a lot of opportunities for for that we call inspired civilians to get involved mm-hmm. with us. Um, you know, we we have one thing I didn't I didn't talk about, and I'll touch on it real briefly is our 9/11 heroes run. Uh, we have 5K runs in the month of September all across the world. Uh, this year, in the month of September, we executed 55 runs. And these are great ways where we're going into different communities and we're making sure we honor the service and sacrifice of our men and women who serve both in the military and our first responders. And, again, you talk about that that community effect, um, bringing 50,000 people out all at the same time to make sure we honor and um, honor the, those sacrifices and honor that service and make sure that we're teaching the next generation uh, what it means to live a life of service, both uh, in as uh, you know, a member of the military or first responder, or as mm-hmm. a servant leader in your own backyard. So that means like working with school children. Sure. Um, yeah. And and doing outreach in that way. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. I see on your website where people can go and look at where race is within their state and within their area, or they can go ahead and register to pretty much have a race get going. Yes. We, um, again, we had 55 races. 48 of them were uh, domestic this year. The rest were international. And we're always looking for new, inspired civilians or veterans, uh, you know, anybody who wants to get involved. Mm-hmm. The idea of starting a Heroes Run in your, in your town, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's an incredibly rewarding experience. So where can our listeners, um, again, find, you know, get connected with the Travis Mannion Foundation? Uh, Again, best way to do it is through our website, uh, travismannion.org. Also, encourage everyone to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all, you know, we're on all the different social media platforms. Just search us at Travis Mannion Foundation. Well, thank you for taking the time to be on the show with us today, Ryan. Thank you so much. Uh, Incredible opportunity, and I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in today. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.